music with chocolate rice. Food provided by Boneyard Barbecue, 333, Kona Ice, and more. Come join the whole ALCF community at this fun family event. We regularly host a wide range of activities here at ALCF, but none of them would be possible without the help of those who serve. If you are a covenant partner who is actively serving in a ministry, we want to honor you at the Contributors Appreciation Event on Friday, May 4th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Don't miss this great opportunity to meet and fellowship with others like you who continue to do so much for the ALCF community. Also happening in May is our Great Family Gathering, which takes place on Wednesday, May 9th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. It's your monthly opportunity to get together with others in the ALCF community over a meal to connect, develop deep relationships, and get equipped to answer relevant issues facing us today as Christians in the Bay. To seeing you, and don't forget to bring a dish to share with your ALCF family. We've got a special opportunity for young adults to connect with others at ALCF. If you're 18 to 30-ish and looking to go deeper in your walk with a community of young adult believers, or if you're not a believer but would like to learn about God's plan for your life, join our young adults group on Wednesday, May 23rd from 7.30 to 8.45 p.m. in the chapel. You'll have a chance to hang out in a relaxed environment filled with games, events, speakers, informal discussions, and much, much more. We cannot leave May without talking about our Mother's Day events. The Real Options 5K Walk for Life takes place on Saturday, May 12th, starting at 8.30 a.m. at Marital Cottle Park in San Jose and Kennedy Park in Union City. It's a great opportunity to honor your mother by celebrating the gift of life. Sign up at friendsofrealoptions.net to join the life-affirming annual event that benefits thousands of mothers, families, and students in our community. We'll also honor our mothers here at Abundant Life during our service on Sunday, May 13th at 10 a.m. with a special Mother's Day celebration you won't want to miss. And speaking of our mothers, many of them serve tirelessly throughout the year in Safari Kids. We'd like to give them and the rest of our Safari Kids team a much deserved break this summer. But we need your help. If you love the word, love working with kids, and would love the opportunity to bring them together, Safari Kids may be perfect for you. If you're interested in possibly serving this summer, please contact Stacy Davidson at safarikids at alcf.net. No experience is necessary. We'll provide you with hands-on training May 20th through June 3rd in preparation for service between June 17th and August 19th. If you're looking for a church home and want to know more about our history, mission, and core values, sign up for our next Exploring Covenant Partnership event on Sunday, May 20th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. You can register at alcf.net slash signups or through the ALCF app. To stay connected with everything ALCF, check out our website, app, bi-weekly emails, and social media. And remember, at ALCF, our goal is to make a difference in you so you can make a difference in the lives of the people in your sphere of influence. Or as we like to say around here, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world. And so, Father God, we declare that our lives are not your own, our own. They belong to you. And Lord God, we do pray that you would build and mold and shape us into your image. God, I'm well aware that there are plenty of people here this morning, right here in this room, who, who would not claim to be followers of you. And we are excited that they are here. And God, I pray that you would speak to them through your word, that you would show them the futility of trying to build a life on money and the things of this life, because nothing in this life can satisfy. I'm thinking of the words of Augustine who said, our 
hearts are truly restless. And we'll never find our rest until we rest in you. So, Lord God, manifest yourself in this place. That way, use me, I pray, to that end. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, please take them out. Meet me in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11 is going to be our text for today. Uh, I really just kind of want to build off of what Rich and Glenn have already shared, is this is our Sinned Sunday, and I want to just kind of give some biblical parameters as to why it's important for you to contemplate these things uh, on um, hopping on a plane, trusting God for $3,300. I don't know how you do your finances, but I don't just have a discretionary $3,300, uh, but I got a daddy who does, and uh, I ain't talking about Crawford Loretz because he would not be like, yeah, I can't call him. I'm 45 years of age. I got a heavenly daddy who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So I do pray that you would contemplate trusting God to this degree by giving your life away to wherever he may, he may send you. Let me just say one more thing until we jump, uh, before we jump into the text, and that is uh, we are an equipping church. God's planted us right here in the bay, love the bay, uh, but this is not the Bible Belt. Um, 10 million people, 2 to 3% Christian, and uh, God expects us to love on them well and engage them uh, for his glory. Uh, here at Abundant Life, we call ourselves not an attractional church. This isn't the Brian LaRitz show where you come and hear a speaker. Um, if that's what you're here for, you are going to be sorely disappointed. We've come to see Jesus. This is all about Jesus and getting equipped. We are an equipping church. We exist to give you the tools uh, to make disciples, to engage people well in your various spheres of influence. In fact, we'll talk about some of that in just a few moments. Have an exciting opportunity for you to jump in on coming up in a couple of weeks. Saturday, kind of for a half day, uh, I'm bringing in a good friend of mine, Dr. Bobby Conway. He's already got one doctorate, finishing up a second doctorate. Uh, He's known as the one-minute apologist. God has really uniquely gifted him uh, to take um, huge concepts like suffering and evil and how can we trust that the scriptures are true and Uh, arguments for the existence of God and uh, making them highly accessible to any person, no matter what their walk of life may be. And so this is kind of Skepticville, USA. Uh, You probably work with skeptics, live next door to skeptics uh, who have huge questions and wouldn't call themselves Christians and just are questioning how a good God could allow evil in this world and how can we trust the scriptures and how do you know God even exists? Well, I want to encourage you to show up to this discipleship summit on uh, on April 21st and get some answers and get equipped to actually uh, reach and engage people in your spheres of influence for the glory of God. You can go online and register. Acts chapter 1, pick me up in verse 6. Luke writes these words. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Make, make note of this verse, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, uh, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Living in Silicon Valley, you're well acquainted with this story. In the early 1980s, uh, Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple, uh, is aggressively trying to recruit the president of Pepsi. His name was uh, John Scully, uh, trying to recruit him out of Pepsi to come join what Jobs is doing right here uh, in the Bay with Apple. And Jobs was relentless, and each time John Scully kept turning him down and turning him down and turning him down, made all the sense in the world. I mean, why would John Scully leave um, an established 
brand like Pepsi for what was kind of this fledgling thing back in the day known as, known as Apple. Uh, and so Scully was like, man, this guy's out of his mind. But Jobs, being Jobs, refused to take no for an answer. He kept after him, kept after him, kept after him. And Scully kept telling him no and telling him no and telling him no. And finally, you, you know how it ends. Uh, Steve Jobs finally looked at, um, at John Scully and says, hey, man, are, are, are you going to be content just to make sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come join me and change the world? I mean, that's literally what he said. Are are you going to give your life to making sugar water for the rest of your life? Or are you going to come join me and change the world? And these words just kind of struck a chord in John Scully. It, It just kind of sat in the pit of his soul, so to speak. And sure enough, not long after Steve Jobs just kind of issued that kind of gauntlet to him, John Scully quit his job at Pepsi and moved here to the Bay and locked arms with Steve Jobs at this new thing called Apple. Now, the question on the table is why in the world would John Scully leave something established, something secure, to get on board with Apple. He didn't probably leave for the money. He didn't leave because Apple was more stable and secure at the time. I think the reason why John Scully left was because what Steve Jobs was offering him wasn't so much a paycheck as it was a sense of mission. What drove John Scully to leave the known for the unknown was this driving sense of mission. I want to talk to you today about mission. I I really believe the three most significant days in your life is the day in which you were born, the day in which you were born again, that is, you became a follower of Jesus Christ, and the day in which you found out why you were born. I got three boys. You hear me talk about them all the time, Quentin, Miles, and Jaden, 17, 15, and 13, and I sit down with my boys all the time, and from the time we were little, I, I just kind of ripped this off from a, from a professor named Howard Hendricks. He's a, he, he was a, a, a well-known professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He says, really, uh, life can be reduced to three big questions. Question number one is, who, who's your master? All of us in this room right now, we have a master. Life is at the sweetest when our master is, is spelled with a capital M, and that's Jesus Christ. But, but either you're working for yourself or you're working for him. So all of us right now, we, we have a master. Next major question, what's your mission? Why are you here? What, 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 are, you, what are you here for? Uh, some of you all, and I, and I tell you this all the time, I mean, when people first came to California, they came to this part of California, and, and, and they came here for gold. So I believe there's a spirit of, of, of mammon here. People are still coming here to get rich, to make money. I mean, just, again, on the golf course the other day, me and Miles were hanging out. We went to the driving range, uh, saw this one guy I've been trying to share my faith with, and I've gotten to get to know him a little bit. And he's a 32-year-old retiree who plays 36 holes of golf every single day. And, and, and for him, that's the dream. He did the startup, cashed out, late 20s, and, and now he's on the golf course every single day. And, and I just, you know, in the nicest way possible, trying to maintain the friendship, I just want to go, is, is that working for you? Like, like is, this, is this scratching you where your soul itches? I mean, I mean that's, that's not the dream. That's not the dream. But there's so many people who come to the bay, and it's the best of the best, the brightest of the bright, and that's some of you right now. And, man, you're just, you're just hoping that the startup hits. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if and when it does hit, and you get your millions or your billions. If you want to know how you're going to feel, go to a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes, written by a guy named Solomon. And Solomon was a billionaire many times over. You know what he says is he's just perusing all of his riches, all of the women, all of the homes. You know, he had the, the, the latest chariot with the 26-inch rims on it. Um, you know, he's just looking at all this stuff. And what is he saying? Vanity of vanity. He says, let me just save you some hurt and heartache. It's empty. Some of y'all are like, I'd love to find that out on my own. Let me, let me reach my own conclusion on that one, Pastor. But some of you are here today, and you're doing exceedingly well in your career, in your profession, and I would suggest to you the very fact that you're here right now is indicative of the point that I'm making. If your career or profession was scratching you where your soul itched, you wouldn't be here. The very fact that you're here means 
you can't find ultimate satisfaction in this life because this life was never designed to give you ultimate satisfaction. So what you need is something beyond paychecks. You, you need more than that. You've you got to figure out what your mission is. Now, for some of you type A personalities, you said there were three M's. So I tell my boys, there's the master, there's the mission, there's the mate. And it should be in that order. So by the time I'm telling my boys, by the time you get married, you should have a grip on what direction your life's going in. Now, when I first got married to Corey, I was Poe. Couldn't afford the other O and the R. I was Poe. Okay. <laughs> But my wife would tell you, even though I was Poe, she said, I just sensed that you had a sense of where your life was headed. There was, there was movement there. So I want to talk to you about that second M today. It's mission. To understand this, to get our arms around this, um, if you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, here's what you need to know about Jesus. Among other things, he was a man uh, who was driven by mission. Uh, he came here to earth took on flesh, dwelt among us. His mission was clearly stated when he said, I came here to seek and to save that which was lost. That would be all of us. Jesus didn't come here to enjoy the fineries of life, the accoutrements of life. Jesus came, lived the life we could never have lived, died the death we should have died, was buried in a borrowed tomb, resurrected the third day according to the scriptures. Why? So that you and I might find ultimate satisfaction in him and would reign with him throughout all eternity. He was driven by mission. One of the missions that Jesus came for was the establishment of his kingdom here on earth. Jesus came announcing the kingdom of heaven, and he called and invited people into that mission to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So one of the things you have to understand about Jesus is he was constantly giving people invitations to get in on this, to get in on his IPO, his, his initial public offering of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to get in on this thing. Well, what, what's the stock price? Oh, it's through the roof, but you won't get paid in this life. You'll get paid in the life to come. That's what Jesus does. He comes here. And so one scene early on in the book of Luke, he's, uh, he's by the Sea of Galilee. He notices Peter, James, and John. They've been fishing all night, haven't really caught anything, not really working out. He says, cast to the other side of the boat. They do that. They catch the mother load. And, and then when they come back into shore, he says, listen, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I just kind of imagine that conversation. We know Peter was married because um, the Bible tells us he had a mother-in-law, and I just kind of imagine you know, him going home later on that day and telling his wife, I quit my job. And his wife just kind of got a bunch of questions. Oh, really, what's the new job? Uh, I'm going to follow this man named Jesus, and um, he called me to make Fisher's event. Really, what's it paying? He didn't say. Well, what's the benefit package? Don't know. That was not a happy time in Peter's home. But why did Peter quit his job? Because what Jesus spoke to, no job could give him. He spoke to his soul. And like Steve Jobs with John Scully, he gave him a mission, gave him something to do outside of himself. That's what Peter was all about. Now we come to our text, and our text is all about mission. Jesus Christ is about to board a cloud, go back to heaven, and as he's boarding this cloud, he gives them another mission. He says, look, guys, you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That is your mission. And I want you to, I want you to latch into it. And if you read the rest of the book of Acts, what you see here is the, the, the apostles, they hear this mission, they, they take it, they embrace it, they get after it, and what happens? They literally turn the world upside down. I mean, they walk into the New York City of their day, Ephesus, with this mission. And the Bible says in Ephesus, and I've been praying for this for Abundant Life and the Church of Jesus Christ in the Bay, that when they got there, there was no little disturbance because of the way. I mean, wouldn't that be great if San Francisco and San Jose would say about a few believers at Abundant Life, there was no little disturbance. I mean, the, these people rocked our worlds. 
What rocked us wasn't the latest kind of uh, self-driving car. What rocked us wasn't some technology. It was the ancient message of Jesus Christ that a few believers actually believed in and said, you know what, I'm going to actually live this out, and I'm going to live my life with open hands saying, God, I'm not my own. I'm completely available to you. Do what you want to do with my life. I believe this band of believers can do what they did in Acts. In fact, Jesus said, greater works than these. Will you do? I'm I'm preaching like I'm the only one up in here who believes this. So I believe that you're here today, not ultimately because you got into Stanford or Berkeley. I believe God's called you here to this part of the bay for this season of your life, not just because of, of your, you know, your acumen when it comes to science and technology. I believe God's called you here to the bay for something even greater than companies, for something even greater than schools. He wants you for this moment in time in your life to be about the business of advancing his kingdom in one of the most godless p- places on the face of the earth. That's why you're here. So we all need to flip a switch and say, I'm here more than, 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 than for Teslas. I'm here for more than just houses or business or money. I am actually here to get in on the kingdom of heaven and to advance and bring this kingdom in this part of the bay. Now, here's what's interesting. If you study the disciples, they weren't wealthy. In fact, everything suggests they were They were broke. They were poor, like me. They were called illiterate, unlearned men. They weren't weren't adored by the world. Most of them died a martyr's death. John was exiled. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. And yet, Even though they were considered the scum of the earth, here's what I want you to understand. They lived some of the most satisfied lives you could ever live. Or take Jesus. He lives for 33 years, never gets married, homeless, poor, no place to lay his head, but you won't find a more satisfied person. What's the common denominator? Living on mission. I want to ask you a question right now, and it's not a rhetorical question. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I actually want you to take out a piece of paper and a pen. If you're old school or maybe you've got your device, turn them on right now and just click on your notes app. I literally want you to write down the answer to this question. There's there's no wrong answer. I'm, I'm asking this question directly to you. I want you to just kind of look over your life. And I want you to think right now when life was the sweetest. And what I mean by that is when you just felt like, man, I am most fulfilled, I'm most satisfied for a significant stretch in your life. I want you to think about that right now. Now, here's the question. Why are you the most fulfilled and why are you the most satisfied? I want you to write that down. Think about when, when, when you were going, man, this is exactly what I signed up for. I mean, you're just kind of driving down the street and your soul is just exhaling. I want you to think about that. I want you to write it down. What, when were you the most satisfied and the most fulfilled? I'm, I'm gonna, if I was a betting man, I shouldn't bet in church. I'm sorry to say I'd bet you. Um, God wouldn't like that. But here's what I want to say to you. I bet you, there I go again, you weren't fulfilled or satisfied ultimately. No one's going to write down when I drove that new car off the parking lot or when I got that bonus check. I guarantee you that your answer is tied into some sort of a mission. Let me give you a couple snapshots from my life. You've heard me tell this story before. I, I, um, I worked for several years at a 6,000-person church in Charlotte. I was a staff pastor with them, and then all of a sudden, God just kind of invaded my life in January of 2003, rocked my world, and uh, he said, I actually want you to plant a church. Church planting had never been on my radar before. I actually thought I'd walk into an existing situation, be used of God to help uh, transition that thing around, but God says, no, I want you to plant a church. I want you to leave a 6,000 person church uh, where you don't have to think about a paycheck. It just comes every 1st and 15th and you've got stability. It says, I actually want to bring you to a new dimension of, of trust and sacrifice in your walk with me. Uh, I want you to plant a multi-ethnic church and what's the hardest urban center to do that in the country? Yep, that would be Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I want you to trust me to bring blacks and whites together in the city that assassinated Dr. King. Oh, and I'm going to give you 26 people to start, and um, uh, you're going to have to trust me for every single paycheck you get in the early uh, phases of that ministry. So we had just bought our house. 
I'm like, okay, I think I'm hearing God. We, we close on our house. I lose $13,000. I know living in the Bay, you can't, you can't fathom that, right? I actually lost money on a house. Uh, here you're in, in a house for two days, and you make $2 million off of it, but that's not how the rest of the country works. And so I lost thirteen i am like, okay, God, I think I'm hearing you right. I, I pack up my, our, our home and Corey and our little uh, 19-month-old son and our, our newborn, and we, we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm trusting God, trusting God, trusting God, trusting God, trusting God. God, trusting God, and at the same time, I can just tell you time after time after time, I'm driving down 385 or Poplar or Walnut uh, Grove there, and, and there's just something in me that goes, man, this is, this, is, this is exactly what I signed up for. Don't know how I'm going to get paid next, but this is exactly what I signed up for. And the fulfillment that was there, because I'm trusting God, and I'm getting off of the umbilical cord of mom and daddy's faith. And I'm trusting God for myself, and I'm living on mission. So I do that for 11, 12 years. Then God shows up again. He says, look, I actually want you to get rid of your 3,500-square-foot house that you paid $2 for, and uh, I want you to move uh, to New York City and be a part of this thing that I'm doing in that church. And so we, we transition from a 3,500-square-foot house to a 900-square-foot apartment. That's right. We purge 75% of our possessions. 75% of it. And I just got to tell you, even as I'm purging my, those possessions, there's a couple times Corey and I looked at, it, at each other and go, this is nauseating. It's how much stuff. And so we just kind of whittle down, whittle down, whittle down, whittle down, whittle down, whittle down, and we move into the apartment. And I can't tell you how many times, hopping on the subway at the 79th Street Station, taking on into Times Square uh, to just trust God and help out with this church, my soul just exhaled and goes, this is exactly what I signed up for. Just when I get comfortable there, Abundant Life calls. And uh, I hear, you know, a whole lot about this church and the pain you've gone through. And God didn't call me here to be the Savior. There's one Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm coming here, man. There's about 300 people in the auditorium. And this big old 2,000-seat auditorium, about 300 people here. And, 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 um, and God calls me here, man. And I'm just, I got a million questions of God. And God's like, hey, trust me. Um, so far, I've proven myself to be 1,000, 4,000 in your life. You ain't missed any meals looking at you. So I'm with you. So we pack up, we move out here, and I, I just got to tell you that, yeah, there's been some challenges here, but I can't tell you how many times I've, I've gotten on the 280 from my home in San Jose and sat in traffic for about five hours to get here, and, uh, and something in me just exhales. This is, this is exactly what I signed up for. I, I don't know about you, but, but for me, life is the sweetest, and I tend to be the most fulfilled when I'm trusting God the most. So I, I, I just want you to get in on this. And so, so what today is about, it's about Sin Sunday. And what I want you to understand is, is that, yes, individually, God has a mission for each of, of us. In, in fact, for some of you all, uh, it could mean literally quitting your job and going to, into vocational ministry. For most of you, that's not what God wants. It is quite possible for you to be in the marketplace killing it and living on mission for God. I got one friend of mine, and, and he says to me, he's the most generous person I know. He says, look, here's, here's what I know. God has given me an incredible capacity to make a lot of money. And I'm like, amen, praise the Lord. But he says, and God has also given me an incredible gift and joy and satisfaction in giving away a whole lot of money. He says, that's my calling. My calling is to make a lot and to give a lot. That's his calling. But, but here's what I want you to see. That's a mission mindset. And, and so what he's done is he goes, because that's my calling, I'm just going to cap my standard of living. He says, well, what am I going to do, buy five more jet skis? It's getting quiet in here. So I'm gonna, am I going to die and stand in the presence of the Lord and jet ski my way into his presence? You ain't taking it with you. I've done a whole lot of funerals, and one thing I've never seen at a funeral is a U-Haul truck. And naked, you came into this bad boy, and naked, you're going to go back, and your wife going to spend up all that life insurance money. Hopefully not on the new dude. But here's what I want you to understand. This is a missions, this is a missions mindset. 
And, and, and God wants us to live on mission. So here's what we've been talking about. Yes, there's an individual mission that God's calling us into, and life is sweet as there. But our passage is not so much about the individual. It, it, is, it, is, it is the mission of what the church is supposed to be about. So his instructions are not so much to individuals as it is to this is what the church is to be about. And fundamentally, when you look at Jesus and his mission, the church's mission is is to align with that mission, and that mission is to bring the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does it mean to bring the kingdom of heaven? I remember studying this with the mission team, uh, with, uh, with Rich and Glenn, and they've just done a phenomenal job. And what we discovered is the kingdom of heaven, to simplify, can always be whittled down to two things. When Jesus brought the kingdom, here's what it meant. Number one, he, 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 he brought the kingdom as it relates to people's souls. He constantly announced, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to turn from darkness to light. I want you to turn from doing life on your terms to now surrendering your life life to me. That's why he would constantly say, come and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Live for my agenda and not for your agenda. So the kingdom, what does it mean to bring the kingdom? It means that we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And every time we do that, we are getting in on the kingdom of heaven. But secondly, to bring the kingdom means that I I physically minister to the felt needs of other people. Now, if you look at Jesus, it's kind of disturbing. Jesus spent an awful lot of time healing people, feeding people, clothing people, enriching the lives of people. In fact, a lot of times when he would heal people like paralytics, he would say, now, now look, take up your mat and go home, which is code for Now you can go back to work. So that the ministry of Jesus, as he's healing people and sending them back whole, back to their communities, he's now enriching those communities because now instead of people consuming from those who have, they're now turned from consumers to contributors because he's ministered to their felt needs. So as we think about missions at Abundant Life, it fundamentally has to do with bringing the kingdom, which means when we bring the kingdom, we are just joining in on what God is already doing in Zambia and what God is already doing in Mexico. Let me just say a word. This is not American colonialism where we're going to go to those third world countries, and please don't use that phrase in this church. But it is not us just going to help those people. That's paternalistic. And don't assume that God is not already at work there. So we're just joining in on what God is already doing. The kingdom is already advancing there. And now God is saying, listen, I, I, want, I want you to join in on that. I want you to be a part of that. I, I want you to see what I'm doing. And so, and so I, I hope as you're hearing this stuff, something in you, maybe God is saying, I, I want you to change your vacation plans this summer. I, I want you to change how you, how you look at your discretionary time off. Because I promise you, when you're flatlining, when you're flatlining, you're not going to say, oh, man, I should have bought the season pass to Disneyland. Nothing wrong with going to Disneyland. But I want you to close your eyes for a minute and just imagine you're, you're at death's door and you get an opportunity to either do Disneyland or Zambia. I think you know the answer to that one. Let me end with three quick thoughts on what it means to live on mission. Now, why is this stuff important? N- number one, the way Jesus phrases it here is he, he makes mission the joyful mandate of the church. Look at what he says in verse 8. In verse 8, he says, you shall be my witnesses. Shall be, shall be, shall be. He's not giving us tweetable advice to consider. He's not suggesting. He's saying, if you're a part of my church as an individual or abundant life collectively, I'm actually joyfully mandating you to get in on this call to be about mission. You shall be, and you've heard me say this before, not you shall be my lawyers. God didn't call us to be lawyers. He didn't call us to argue and convince people and reason people into the kingdom. 
Now, is it, is it good to have credible answers to the questions that they have? Absolutely. That's why we're doing the Discipleship Summit. But he's called us to be witnesses. Uh, that Greek word, witness, is marturia, from which we get the English word martyr from. All a witness does is he says, look, this is what's happened to me, and let me talk about what happened to me and just share what happened to me, and then God uses that in the lives of other people. In John chapter 9, there's a man who was born blind who, who gets healed, and the religious elite are disturbed. Jesus has the nerve to heal somebody on the Sabbath. And they're asking this guy who can now see, uh, how did all this happen? And I love his answer. He says, man, I don't know. I don't know anything about this Jesus. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. That's all I know. And so when Rich talks about, listen, when Rich talks about, we're going to Zambia, we're going to do a seven-week class, and a part of the things you're going to learn in that class is you're going to learn how to put a testimony together. That's what we're talking about in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8. All you have to be able to do is, look, all I know is I was living life one way, and then Jesus stepped into my life. He turned my life upside down, and let me just tell you the changes he's made in that life, and I'm telling you, when you do that, you're going to see God do amazing things because there's power in the word of your testimony. Of what God is doing in your life. God's going to use that big time to advance the kingdom. Now, some of you are, are hearing about Zambia and you're hearing about Mexico. And, and, and some of you, when you hear about being as witnesses and sharing your testimony and evangelizing, there's a big lump in your throat. And let me say, that's a good thing. Here's why. There's always a gap between God's call and your capacity. I'll give that to you again. Always a gap between God's call and your capacity. If you could fulfill God's call on your own, you wouldn't need them. So I want you to look back at the text. Our text deals with this. Jesus says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, Jesus understands what I'm calling you to do, you don't have the capacity or the resources to do on your own. You can't change the world on your own. You can't change the bay on your own. You can't save anybody on your own. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Um, several years ago, I was on a plane with my youngest son, Jaden. I probably shouldn't have said his name because I'm not going to make him look too great here. Uh, but I'm on, I'm on the plane, and Jaden's Jayden, like, hey, Dad, get your iPad out. I um, want to play you in Scrabble. I'm going to dominate you in Scrabble. He's like a third grader. Now, I don't know how you do it in your house. In my house, I don't let my kids win. That is a rites of passage. I dominate them. I dominate them in anything, and I try to run up the score on them. I try, if I have to cheat on them, I, I'll cheat on them. I just, I, I, I will, they ain't, no, ain't no being a nice pastor out on the basketball court in our backyard. You know, I elbow, I big boy them. Whatever it, whatever it takes to do, I will do. Beating me is a privilege. It is a rites of passage, all right? Um, yeah, I got a lot of, a lot of stories about that. So anyways, Jaden says to me, third grader, he says, take out your iPad, Dad. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a own you in Scrabble. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I take out the iPad, and we're playing Scrabble, and, uh, and Jaden is killing me. He's a third grader. He's a third grader. Now, all my kids are intelligent, but you'll forgive me if I get a little suspicious when he starts coming up with words like genuflect and coalesce. I mean, he's just dominating me. I'm like, I know you go to a good school, but I don't remember seeing that on your weekly spelling quiz. You know what? So I start checking, and this joker, I didn't even realize the game of Scrabble that we have had this option. It has an option where you can click this thing, and it'll, it'll give you your assistant. And what the, what the Scrabble assistant does is it looks at your letters and the letters on the board and makes recommendations on what to do. Now, we had to talk about cheating. <laughs> but listen, some of you are going, there's just no way. There's no way that I can go to Zambia or Mexico and do these huge things. You know what Jesus is fundamentally saying? You have an assistant. Your assistant's name is the Holy Spirit. And you just got to trust him. You got to trust him to kind of be like that little boy who came to Jesus with thousands of people in the multitude, and they're hungry, and Jesus says, what do you have? And the little boy just comes, he says, look, I got a few pieces of fish and a few loaves of bread. Jesus says, look, I'll take that little and I'll multiply it. You know what's interesting? If you study miracles in the Bible, very rarely does Jesus ever do a miracle without somebody bringing him something. 
And that something is a little something. And Jesus specializes in taking our little something something, putting his hands, and now when his hands get on, on that little something something, now we've got a major something. But some of us will not let Jesus blow our minds because we are paralyzed by our inabilities. Jesus says, will you just live with open hands? Will you trust me? First thing we learn about mission, it's a joyful mandate. But secondly, missions is mobile. Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. Watch it in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. I love this. Um, it, just going off of that, you understand that America was never the center of the gospel. I just want you to understand that. We are the uttermost parts. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, they don't even get to us. We're so uttermost, right? So I want you to understand that America is not the center of the world. In fact, when you think of Jesus, he was a Middle Eastern man with olive complexion who never spoke a lick of English. You understand that, right? So I, I, I don't want to set up any missions mindset that takes us back to old school colonialism. It's not what this is about. We are not the center. But scholars tell us if you just look at this, this, this geographic model, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world, that's actually how the whole book of Acts is outlined. It starts off in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then they go to Samaria, then they go to the uttermost parts of the world, which means this. In order to do that, the church became what I call a sending, multiplying factory. So they'd, they'd come in, they'd get saved, they learn their Bible, sent out. Come in, get saved, learn their Bible, get sent out. Come in, get saved, learn their Bible, get sent out. That's not what the church is today. Most of our churches are just input, come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. Let, let, me, let me come to church on Sunday, let me get a good word. And you kind of expect me, to, the pastor, to be like a mama bird who leaves the chicklets, flies out somewhere else, uh, get worms, come back in. Uh, now the chicklets are hungry. They're kind of open up their mouth like this, and I'm regurgitating what I've been studying all week and drop it in their mouth, and then you'll come back next week and expect more, and next week and expect more, and next week and expect more. And at the end of the day, if, if you ain't burning off these calories, some of us are spiritually obese because your paradigm of church is, Pastor, just give me another program. Give me, give, give me another program. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Give me another conference. Give me another women's deal. When's our next men's huddle? All right, we, we, we're, we're going to do that. But you need to be burning off some calories. You, you, you need to be taking some of the stuff you're learning and giving it away to other people. Amen. This is actually how I was, I was groomed. I mean, I'm just so grateful. I'm, I'm going to be with my dad later on this afternoon uh, down in Dallas. And um, it, it's just always so good to be with my father. And my, my father, I'm just a blessed man, especially as a black man, to think that my parents are still together after 47 years of marriage. And my dad's very much engaged in my life. And... <clears throat> And, and, and again, my, my dad, every single week when he was in town, we just had a standing appointment. He'd take me to the local McDonald's or the local Shoney's, and we'd sit there, and he's, you know, writing out how to share your faith and what the spirit-filled life looked like. And he's just kind of discipling me, discipling me, discipling me. And, and then dad, his, his discipleship model was he'd always say, okay, we've learned it, now go do it. I remember when I was about 15 years of age, dad showed up and goes, hey, look, I'm going to Africa. Uh, I'm going to do 10 countries in Africa over about a six-week span, you're coming with me, and uh, you're going to share your testimony. I know you've never done that before. And um, uh, the trip costs thousands of dollars. And he says, I'm not going to give you the money. I don't know how you're going to get the money. Um, I'd recommend you pray and trust God and write some letters. And uh, if you're going to see God show up, and I'm believing the best. And I'm like 15 years old. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay. So got coached in how to write a letter, wrote the letter, prayed, 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 sent the letters out, sent the letters out. And just amazing, age of 15, I'm seeing the money come in. And God brings in all the money for that trip and then some. And then that's when Dad taught me this is what happens when you trust God. So he says, you just need to know, in my discipleship model of you, I actually have to, at this point in your life, start getting out the way so that you can experience God and trust God in new ways. 
And then I get over there, and I start sharing this little simple testimony. Here's how I got saved. Here's what happened to me. I'm his witnesses. And I'm seeing at the age of 15 people hearing my testimony, and they're getting saved. And then I get on the plane to go back, and I got tears in my eyes because I thought I was going there to help them, and God used them to help and change me even more so. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, $3,300. I ain't got that just sitting around somewhere. $3,300. Can you even just give God a chance? I mean, but before you, some of y'all have already done shut him off. Well, I know that ain't the Lord, $3,300. Yeah. <laughs> I know that ain't him. I think God's disrespected by that. Some of you have already said, I done used up all my time at work. Can you at least pray? Can you at least just entertain it? Because to be about the mission of God means that we're just, yeah, we're going to feed you, but we're going to send and send and send and send. Because that's what the church is supposed to be. Let's go home on this one. In order for this to happen, you've got to have a missional mindset. So missions is the joyful mandate of the church. Um, it, 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 it involves being, being mobile. We're sending. But what we need to do right now is to flip a switch and to see everywhere we go as an opportunity to join in on the mission of God. Again, look at what he says. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right here where you're at, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I love this. Jesus says, when it comes to mission, start out where you live. In other words, Jesus is pretty much saying, listen, abundant life, the worst thing you can do is to hear this message and get a bunch of matching T-shirts and uh, board a plane on spring break and go to do in some faraway country what you ain't even doing on your own street. I think it's the epitome of hypocrisy for us to be bold evangelists in Africa but weak here in the Bay. I'm just going to put that out there. If you can't do it in your Jerusalem, don't do it in the uttermost parts of the earth. Start out where you're at. One of the things I love about our church is Cheryl Degree is actually, she's absolutely dominating things here. She's, our, she's really our Jerusalem uh, director. Uh, she's, she's over local missions here, and there's Wonderful opportunities for you to jump in on local missions here. She's sending teams to the, uh, to the prisons and inmates are, are hearing the gospel and being discipled and built up. And there's homeless ministry stuff that's happening. There's educational stuff we're jumping in on. We're fighting for the unborn and partnering with real options. That's Jerusalem stuff that we need to get in on right now. But then there's also global things. But what does this mean? It, it, it means your Jerusalem is where you live it's where you work. It's that Starbucks you frequent. Or that coffee shop, excuse me, Pete's people. It's that place you go to where you hang out. That's, that's your Jerusalem. And Corey and I, we've actually tried to flip a switch and just go, wherever we live is our Jerusalem. Here's what I want you to see. When you get in your car, I should actually get signs that says you are now entering into the mission field. You, you are going to your Jerusalem. So wherever where my wife and I live, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of our next-door neighbor, Bob, back in Collierville, Tennessee, a suburb of Memphis. Bob would, would, would have me over right next door. He'd have me over. We'd play pool in his front room, and we're playing pool and playing pool and playing pool. And sure enough, after a while, he starts opening up to his life to me and, and the miserable, miserable divorce he's going through. And I'm just, okay, God, help me plant a seed in his life. And next thing I know, Bob's showing up to our church. And it's just us being mindful of our Jerusalem. Then we move to New York City, and we're renting, and my wife and I have a prayer. We want to be the best tenant this landlord's ever had. And so we, God help us by, by the way we pay our rent and paying in our time and, and how we relate to our landlord for him to just go special. Something's different. And he wrote us the nicest letter when we moved to come here. He goes, you're the best tenant we've ever had. I, I, I don't say that to brag. I just say, man, that's just us just going, this is our Jerusalem. We're, we're living right here. 
Uh, there's, a, there's a lesbian couple that my wife and I have befriended. They live around the corner from us, and they're over at the house all the time, and we're just loving on them well and engaging them well. This is our Jerusalem. So some of you all are college students. You're at, let, let's say you're at Stanford or Berkeley, wherever it may be. What if you just had the mindset that for these four years, five years, ten years, twelve years, that God's called me here? <laughs> What if you just had the mindset that I'm here more than to just play baseball or to play a sport or to get an education from a prestigious university that's going to look good on a re- What if when I walk on campus, I'm going, this is my mission field. And God's called me to help advance the kingdom right here on, on my college campus, right here on my street where I live, right in my apartment building. That's your Jerusalem. That's your Jerusalem. I'm done. Here's my big ask. I've got this band on, and after service, uh, for everybody who calls Abundant Life home, I I want you to grab one. It just simply says ALCF 2020 Vision. And our 2020 vision is simply this. We want to see everybody who calls Abundant Life home to go on a short-term missions trip by the end of 2020. That's what we want. And so to help us with that, to keep that front and center, we want, we've got these bands. We want you to put on your wrist and uh, leave them on there through the end of 2020. Let them stink. Just let them stink. And every time you look at it, would you just do a couple of things centered around prayer? Number one, w- would you pray for the places we're going to just join in on the kingdom? So you look at that band and you go, man, okay, I'm, I'm going to just spend a few seconds right now and just pray for Zambia. Pray for Mexico. God bless what's happening there. There's great churches already there. Bless the teams that are going there. But secondly, would you just pray, okay, God, how do you want me to join in? How do you want me to be a part of that? I think God's going to make provision for you to go on one or multiple of these trips. Maybe in addition to that, God's going to say, why don't you write some checks to help other people go? But we want to be a sending church, a multiplying church who gets in on the vision. You guys buying into this stuff today? We want to be about the vision and the mission of God. I'm out of time. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I I just feel burdened. Some of you are here today, and if you're to really tell the truth, you're living life on your own terms. There's no sense of mission. And God is messing with you today. And you've just been profoundly convicted. That you've just gotten distracted by life. The problem with life is that life is so daily. And we can get distracted that we're here for a bigger purpose than mortgages and rents and the dailiness of life. God's calling us to be participants in bringing his kingdom. Some of you are here today and you're just going, you know what? I've ventured off course with that. I've just ventured off course. And um, I feel convicted and I just want some prayer. I I just want prayer that God would focus my heart. That, 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 That I would be about what really matters that I would live for his meta-narrative. Others of you, to be quite honest, the reason why you're not living on mission is because you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. You've you've not made him master of your life. Today, God says, I want to be your master. Others of you are here today, and you would say, yeah, maybe I'm doing well in both of those. I just need a church home. We'd love to be your church. I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your family. We'd love if you join in on this mission with us. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, the prayer team people are going to come, and then we're going to open up the altar for you to just come. And you're going to come either to get saved or to just say, you know what, I am saved, but I've just lost focus. I haven't really been living on mission, and I need to be strengthened in that regard. Or I want to take the first step to becoming a covenant partner here at Abundant Life. Father, in the name of Jesus, you've called Abundant Life in every church to join in on your kingdom here on earth. God, this is what we're to be about. 
So yes, Lord God, we're going to always be about teaching and equipping and, and helping people in their journey of discipleship, Lord God, but we're also going to be ascending church. And people are going to hop on planes, they're going to take road trips, and, and yes, we're going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, and we're going to go to our own Judeas, and we're, we're going to just jump in there. We're going to dive in there. But Lord God, also help us to live this out in our own Jerusalem, on our streets, in our apartments, on our campuses, Lord God. That's what we, what we want to be about. And so, Lord God, would you just call us into that, and would we embrace that calling in Jesus' name? Help us to follow you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the ministry that's taking place right here at the altar. We thank you for those who have come. God, there's probably others who are sitting in the audience who, who would say, yes, I've been distracted, or maybe I, I don't know you. Whatever it is, Lord God, would you meet them and minister grace to them as well? Father, we embrace your, your mission for us right now, Lord God. We, we live with open hands. and We say, Lord God, however you want to use us, the answer is yes. Now you just tell us and we'll submit, Lord God. And so, Lord God, I bless this church. I, I, yes, we're going to be an equipping church, but we're also going to be a sending church, Lord God. And so I always, already praise you in advance for the lives that are going to be changed in Zambia, for the lives that are going to be changed in Mexico, for the other destinations we're going to go. We're just, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what you're going to do, Lord God, through this band of believers known as Abundant Life, Lord God. So, Lord God, we trust you big time to raise the money and the resources, Lord God. We trust you big time to give us your Holy Spirit, Lord God, who will bridge that gap between your call and our capacity, Lord God. We praise you in advance for the lives that are going to be saved and changed, Lord God. And we praise you in advance for the way you're going to change us because we've joined in on that mission, Lord God. God, we bless you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Happening at Abundant Life. If you've ever been asked questions about your faith that were difficult to answer or choose not to talk about your faith to avoid potentially tough questions, we've got an event that you'll definitely want to check out. Dr. Bobby Conway, the lead pastor of Life Fellowship Church in North Carolina and founder of the One Minute Apologist, will lead a discipleship summit on April 21st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. His powerful message will equip you with credible answers to properly address curious, faith-related questions and provide you with the inspiration you need to confidently share your faith with others. Also coming in April is a new series from Pastor Brian entitled Unleashed, The Gospel and Relationships. Be sure to join us as Pastor Brian dives into this powerful six-week message starting on April 29th. And after service on April 29th, make plans to attend the Food Truck Fellowship at 11.30 to 2.30 p.m. in the ALCF parking lot. We'll have live jazz music with chocolate rice, food provided by Boneyard Barbecue, 333, Kona Ice, and more. Come join the whole ALCF community at this fun family event. We regularly host a wide range of activities here at ALCF, but none of them would be possible without the help of those who serve. If you are a covenant partner who is actively serving in a ministry, we want to honor you at the Contributors Appreciation event on Friday, May 4th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Don't miss this great opportunity to meet and fellowship with others like you who continue to do so much for the ALCF community. Also happening in May is our Great Family Gathering, which takes place on Wednesday, May 9th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. It's your monthly opportunity to get together with others in the ALCF community over a meal to connect, develop deep relationships, and get equipped to answer relevant issues facing us today as Christians in the Bay. We look forward to seeing you, and don't forget to bring a dish to share with your ALCF family. We've got a special opportunity for young adults to connect with others at ALCF. If you're 18 to 30-ish and looking to go deeper in your walk with a community of young adult believers, or if you're not a believer but would like to learn about God's plan for your life, Join our young adults group on Wednesday, May 23rd from 7.30 to 8.45 p.m. in the chapel. You'll have a chance to hang out in a relaxed environment filled with games, events, speakers, 
informal discussions, and much, much more. We cannot leave May without talking about our Mother's Day events. The Real Options 5K Walk for Life takes place on Saturday, May 12th, starting at 8.30 a.m. at Marital Cottle Park in San Jose and Kennedy Park in Union City. It's a great opportunity to honor your mother by celebrating the gift of life. Sign up at friendsofrealoptions.net to join the life-affirming annual event that benefits thousands of mothers, families, and students in our community. We'll also honor our mothers here at Abundant Life during our service on Sunday, May 13th at 10 a.m. with a special Mother's Day celebration you won't want to miss. And speaking of our mothers, many of them serve tirelessly throughout the year in Safari Kids. We'd like to give them and the rest of our Safari Kids team a much deserved break this summer. But we need your help. If you love the word, love working with kids, and would love the opportunity to bring them together, Safari Kids may be perfect for you. If you're interested in possibly serving this summer, please contact Stacy Davidson at safarikids at alcf.net. No experience is necessary. We'll provide you with hands-on training May 20th through June 3rd in preparation for service between June 17th and August 19th. If you're looking for a church home and want to know more about our history, mission, and core values, sign up for our next Exploring Covenant Partnership event on Sunday, May 20th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. You can register at alcf.net slash signups or through the ALCF app. To stay connected with everything ALCF, check out our website, app, bi-weekly emails, and social media. And remember, at ALCF, our goal is to make a difference in you so you can make a difference in the lives of the people in your sphere of influence. Or as we like to say around here, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world.